Thank you very much. This is a great occasion. I'm really impressed with the number of people that have come. And knowledge is power. It's not limitless power, but it helps to know more about what you're facing. So I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist been, um, for about 25 years. Kansas, then here. So it was interesting to hear the comparisons to Kansas. But been in Oregon since 2001, uh, doing inpatient hospital work and outpatient. Um, it was interest, it's interesting to hear the recent research about does marijuana cause psychosis or schizophrenia? Because I sure have had patients where it looks like that. I've had a number of patients in the hospital who are quite ill, quite psychotic, and as near as we can tell, the reason is the marijuana. A lot of marijuana every day for years, especially, can raise the risk of acting quite psychotic. I've also had patients who either before or after that hospitalization, we kind of figured out they had schizophrenia. And that also seems very clear that they're more susceptible to the hallucinatory and disorganizing effects of marijuana. Um, so that's very true as well I've, in my, from my experience. And a loss of IQ, loss of cognitive functioning. Yeah. I mean, there's an old, I guess it was Cheech and Chong, maybe I'm dating myself, um, the stereotype of the dope-smoking hippies. Hey, man, what do you want to do today? Hey, let's hang out and smoke a joint. And that's it for days, weeks, years. Uh, we've talked for years about the amotivational syndrome of marijuana use. Um, I don't know if that's, as they say, still a thing, but it sure appears to be present. Maybe it's the loss of cognitive functioning that um, kids who smoke a lot of marijuana tend to not do a lot of other things. So I preach that. I do tell when I have patients uh, who were either in, my, in the hospital or in my office or are smoking a lot of marijuana and I say, eh, it's no big problem. I try to emphasize, yes, it is. There are many, many problems it can cause. In addition to being illegal, in addition to being smoke in your lungs, it is a drug. Um, lowers school performance, impairs uh, performance uh, at all kinds of tasks. Um, I think we need to fight against it wherever we can. Um, I don't necessarily say you have zero privacy, but if you've done something dangerous, then you have zero privacy. When kids are hospitalized, uh, parents typically f uh, search their rooms and kids are upset. I say, listen, they're just desperate to find out what happened. Typically for a suicide attempt, but other, other things as well, kids in, in the hospital. Um, Truly not just believing what they say, truly seeking every opportunity to find out what they're doing, to, to talk, uh, have lots of conversations. Um, and sometimes it's meaning set hard limits. You know, you look like you're out of it, and you always look like you're out of it when you go to Johnny's house. I think you're not going to Johnny's house for a while. Well... I lost to say, but I think this is, it's very, very important to w work together. The last thing I'll say is it takes a village. It really does take a village, and villages are great. This is one right here. Get to know your kids, teachers, coaches, pastors, people that are important in their lives. Have the kids over to your house as much as possible so you get to know them. And if you're worried about your kid, talk to them. Talk to your their teachers, coaches, pastors, and other parents. Work together. Never worry alone. I say this a lot. Never worry alone. Thanks. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Um, I didn't prepare anything. I was just kind of thrown on the stage here, so bear with me if I uh, stumble on my words. Uh, my name's Kevin. I'm an Oregon City police officer. I'm currently assigned to Graveyard Patrol. Um, I've been working the road for about three years. Um, I had various experience volunteering before that. Um, and basically what I was asked to be here is, um, as, well, as long as, or as, in conjunction with working the road, I have different assignments as a police officer. Um, I have the privilege and the opportunity of filling in as the school resource officer here at the high school. Um, so on occasion I get to talk to juveniles, um, handle the calls inside the school, and 
I would say the majority of them have something to do with some sort of substance abuse, um, as well as my calls for service on the road. Um, I have an interest in drugs um, and substances that pair people to include marijuana and other um, substances as well, along with marijuana. And one of the things I've done since I've been a police officer, just based on curiosity, is um, I arrest somebody who's been arrested, you know, say 30 times in this county. They're, they cycle in and out. Um, they're being arrested for serious offenses, serious drugs. And I always ask them, hey, can you kind of tell me your story, if you don't mind? How did you come to be this way? And I'll tell you, 90% of the time, they tell me, well, I started smoking marijuana in high school, or I was at a party and I was smoking marijuana, and then my friend told me, hey, try this. And so I kind of see a common root and where all this kind of stems from. And um, anyway, that's kind of the experience I bring, um, both in my professional life as well as my personal life. I've had friends or associates that I knew in high school that uh, had to break ties with. It all started with marijuana consumption in high school. Uh, moved on to college. Um, it affected me sometimes, applying for jobs, having those associates. So even if kids aren't using and they're just around it, um, I think sometimes the, the perception is that if I'm not using, I'm safe. But there's a lot to be learned. And thank you guys for being here. Hi. Oh, sorry, I'm Amber and I work at the juvenile department. Sorry, I'm getting over a cold, so my voice is not that great. Um, I work with our juvenile drug court, and so these are kids who are doing um, intensive outpatient treatment. So they come to our juvenile department or they do their different treatment groups in um, at the juvenile department or at their behavioral health. And um, they do individual family counseling. They do um, groups, a couple groups a week. And then they also do family counseling and family groups as well. So obviously all of the kids that I work with um, have drug addiction issues and um, all of the kids that I work with as well also started with using marijuana as their first drug um, and then have moved on depending on hanging out with their friends or other people um, and things like that. So that's my experience with kids. So I'm Paige, and one of the um, hats that I wear um, in my practice is I collaborate a lot with Amber um, at the juvenile department. And so I just want to speak from that perspective, because the families that I work with, um, they by the time they get the services and the access to the juvenile department are just heartbroken. And the thing that I hear repeatedly is... Um, that it had to get to this level for them to access services because it's really hard for families to know where to turn to help, um, where to get support, and those kinds of things. And so I'd echo some of what Judge McNeese said is, you know, as parents or as mentors, coaches, teachers, whatever role you are, to really pay attention to what's going on in our youth's lives. Because if there's anything that we can do to, to get in there and stop some of this sooner, um, give them more direction, um, provide clarity, you know, uh, talk with them about the choices that they're making and why they're making those choices, you have a chance to stop it before it gets to that level, before you feel pretty hopeless and you're exhausted and all of those things because um, it's, it's really heartbreaking to have to work with the families who feel like, you know, they've, they didn't want that for their child. Their child certainly didn't want it for themselves um, and just to feel that desperation. So if I would echo some of two of what um, where the panelists have talked about, you know, talk with your kids ahead of time, give them the information, set some really clear structure and be consistent to that structure. Um, so the kids know what the boundaries are and they can move within those boundaries, but then they know what their response is from a parent perspective if they go outside of those boundaries, that we don't stick our head in the sand and just ignore it. and the judge to come back up and we're going to have you guys sit up here and we're going to start going through the questions and I've already received a number of them if you if you wish to uh, if you wish to ask a question please fill out we've got folks walking around to pick those up 
and what I guess uh, for the, uh, the six of you now, when I read a question, I'm going to ask that whoever feels comfortable go ahead and take the mic and, and go forward. And if somebody else wants to follow up on that, we can. Um, uh, the first question I've got here is, can kids get addicted to pot? Is it really addictive? Now, Eric, I know you just spent about 30 minutes on that, but uh, does anybody else want to touch on that? Anybody else want to touch on that? You're the expert. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, yes, it's in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Um, it's just generally accepted in, in psychiatry, behavioral health, and addiction treatment um, that marijuana can be an addictive substance, but obviously it's to some people. So I showed you the chart of the people who use the most, and it's similar to alcohol, it's similar to tobacco and other drugs. There's a lot of people that use chemicals occasionally, occasionally, and then there's some people that use chemicals chronically. So people do meet the diagnostic criteria um, for cannabis dependence, um, a substance use disorder, and they meet all of the symptoms, tolerance, withdrawal, um, negative uh, life experiences, and, and an array of problems in their life that classifies it as a, a, an addictive disorder. Because I know a couple of our speakers talked about the people that they see often started as young people with marijuana and then progressed to harder drugs. Does everyone, and of course in my world, I see a lot of that as well, obviously. Does everyone who smokes marijuana end up being a heroin addict or a meth addict? No, it's, it's just that um, um, a lot of people don't understand. Uh, when scientific preventionists came up with the term gateway drug, most people in society heard the word cause, that, that alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana cause addiction to cocaine or heroin. And that's not what they meant. They said when they looked at hundreds of thousands of kids, they found out that kids walked through the gate of alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana before they started using other drugs like cocaine and heroin. And when they looked at kids that were using cocaine and heroin, they couldn't find any that had not started on alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana. And that's what they meant. They were talking about a correlation, not causation. But people in society heard the word cause, or they thought the word cause, and they sort of rebelled against that idea, which makes sense that you would rebel against that idea because it's not cause, it's correlation. And of alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana, of those three drugs, which one has the highest correlation, the highest statistical probability for later illicit drug use? Tobacco. Early onset tobacco use has the highest correlation with later illicit drug use later in life. Great, thank you. Um, Question here for the panel. How many kids in Oregon City actually use pot? Paige, do you want to take that or is there? I think it's probably the officer, Amber, who's probably best suited for that. Okay. I would have no, <laughs> I would have no idea to answer that intelligently, but um, Eric? Yeah. <laughs> you want to sit here? So, so I, I don't, I'm not sure about Clackamas. I think Clackamas numbers are, are when it comes to marijuana, I believe in the SWS, it's a little bit lower than the statewide average for marijuana, just ever so slightly. But in Oregon, for example, among 11th graders in the SWS, the Student Wellness Survey, about 33% report past 30-day alcohol use, so that's one-third. It's about 19% thereabouts for marijuana use in the last 30 days. Um, for tobacco, it's about 10%, and for uh, non-prescribed uh, prescription drugs, pharmaceutical drugs, it's about 7%, and for drugs like cocaine, methamphetamine, heroin, and stuff like that, it's a little over 2%. Thank you. For 11th graders. Uh, Dr. Ansroth, I've been hearing about marijuana and causing psychosis, and I know you touched this on your comments. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? Is it real? Um, well, I, I think the research, is, as Eric was saying, was a little more clear than what I've thought and experienced. It doesn't cause schizophrenia per se, but it 
increases the susceptibility to psychosis or triggers or activates, I think that makes sense with my experience, triggers or activates a vulnerability to psychosis or schizophrenia. So there may be at some point a blood test that can be taken to see if you are a person who is at risk for becoming schizophrenic or having schizophrenic-like symptoms from marijuana. There are probably going to be a number of those kinds of genetic tests that will evolve to be available to regular people. We don't have them yet. Um, I think it. I would more look at it if there's any family history of schizophrenia or psychotic disorders in your family, extended family, particularly close relatives, you shouldn't touch the stuff or something like that. You are more risk for potentially having that kind of an illness or getting activated by cannabis. Go ahead, Sam. Thanks. What is the legal risk of an adult providing marijuana to a teenager? Kevin, do you want to take this one? or? Yeah, maybe you can... Add to me, add to it. If, what was it? Can you repeat the question, please? What is the legal risk of an adult providing marijuana to a teenager? Um, the legal term that I operate on is DCS, or distribution of a controlled substance. It holds true for any illegal narcotic, um, spe specifically marijuana, or specifically marijuana. Um, it is a felony in the state of Oregon. Um, it's something that's very serious. It would go to the Clackamas County District Attorney's Office. Um, but me, myself, I've been involved in cases where adults are arrested for providing marijuana. Typically it's um, kind of a relationship where it's an older friend's brother or something like that. Um, but there have been more serious cases where an actual grown adult is providing the marijuana to younger folks. And um, I would say 99% of the time it leads to an arrest and a prosecution of a felony crime. And I might comment, Major 91 did not change DCS to a minor with marijuana. It is still a class A felony. And if there's more than a three year difference, you're at risk for significant prosecution. Thanks. Next question. Uh, I use cannabis and I don't think it's a big problem. Uh, what's the best way to tell my kids uh, that I'm a regular cannabis user? So I think that that's a really difficult conversation to have with your youth. Um, from my and, and I think that you have to look at what, what is the purpose of sharing that information. Um, because I, in all of my years, I haven't had um, a adult or a parent share that information with their child and have it really kind of come back well, where they're like, I'm so glad that you told me about that, Mom, because now I'm not going to use. It's usually kind of turned the other way um, in a more negative sense. So it's not that there can't be any learning that could happen. Um, it's just not often the case, and it's often used against you. So I think that that can be really challenging. But Eric, you might have something to add to that. Yeah, it becomes a, clearly a kind of a double message. Do as I say, not as I do. You can say, well, I'm an adult, and that is the best clear argument. Um, I, adults can legally drink alcohol um, and buy it anywhere. Minors can't. But it's tough to have a conversation where you say, I smoke a lot of marijuana, but I don't want you to do that. Hmm, really? I Frankly, I think it's a, it's a tough choice, life choice, to consider quitting if you really want your kids to not use. Lead by example. That's what I would have to say. Unless you have a medical, clear medical reason you need it, if you want to lead your kids, quit. Amber, this next one's for you. What happens with the juvenile department or legal system if my child gets caught with marijuana or using it and is under the influence? Well, if it's their first time, they'll come to the juvenile department and they would go through um, what's considered diversion. So they would probably be asked to get a drug and alcohol assessment, which would then figure out what level of um, treatment they would need it, or if they need treatment at all, or if it was their first time. And then probably some type of educational class. Um, and then it's, they're probably involved with the juvenile department for a short period of time if it's their first time. They could also um, lose their driving privileges for up to a year as well. Um, and even, getting, even if they do get their license back, it's still on their record. And so um, the cost for insurance and everything is pretty high. 
the other thing I would comment on, go ahead and pass it to the judge, uh, is that Measure 91 did not change the laws as it relates to uh, youth. Uh, marijuana still has the same consequences after July 1st as it did before for youth. I was just, could you expand for the, for the folks here about the juvenile drug court program? Sure. Great. So the juvenile drug court program is kids who have been using drugs and alcohol for quite a while. It wouldn't be their first time use. Um, but it is a program that um, kids can get in if they're referred to the juvenile department and they reach the criteria of the 2.1 treatment. Then it's anywhere from a seven month at the minimum program and kids finish up to a year and a half. It just depends. Um, how well they do in the program, if they um, do their treatment, if they um, engage in the treatment, if they can stay clean and sober, and if they can truly remain in the program and not have to take um, other, like maybe go into shelter care or something like that because they're struggling at home. Um, so, the, I mean, it just is up to the kids and families about how much they want to engage in the program and the treatment. Uh, next question. I'd rather my teen smoke marijuana than drink. Why is marijuana worse? I don't know who wants to take that. Eric? Well, I, I don't know that marijuana is worse than, than um, um, kids drinking, but kids aren't supposed to be drinking. So um, I'm not, it seems almost like a false choice. Like, well, I have to let my kids use some drugs or alcohol. I have no choice, I have to do that. Um, I, I think that's sort of a false choice, but um, I would say that, that generally, that alcohol is, is worse than marijuana, um, but there are risks associated with marijuana, and one of the risks that, that we often don't talk about is the combination of drugs. So in, in research on driving fatalities, you know, what, what drugs are gonna cause the highest probability of driving fatalities? What are those gonna be? So, say it again? <laughs> drugs, drugs. Is cell phones a drug now? <laughs> I guess it can be like a drug. People are addicted to it, yeah? Well, it's actually alcohol in combination with marijuana. Alcohol in combination with marijuana, drive and faded, is, presents the highest risk, the highest statistical liability for a car accident and fatal car accident. So more than alcohol alone, and significantly more than marijuana alone. So, um, you know, parents have to be concerned about kids combining alcohol and marijuana. And if anybody's ever done that before, combined alcohol and marijuana, you know how impairing that is. It's my understanding that my son died of a combination of alcohol and drugs, and that is, is how he passed. I think there's a hidden risk of underestimating or misjudging the impairment and the cause, the, the problems from marijuana. Yes, probably alcohol is a greater poison to the body systems and maybe more quickly impairs by itself, but combinations of marijuana with all kinds of things are bad. And the idea that is in so much popular culture uh, that it's no big deal, it's really not doing anything, that's dangerous. If your child has a drug problem, who can you contact uh, to seek help? Paige, do you want to start with that? Or? Yeah, if, you're tr if you find your child has a drug problem, uh, whether that's alcohol, marijuana, or, or harder drugs, who can you contact within the system to seek help? Right, and that, that's a great question, and that's kind of what I was referring to before because it, is, it can be difficult. So if you're concerned, um, my first recommendation is to get some information. You know, talk with their coaches, their teachers, friends, you know, whoever you can gather some information to find out what they're noticing too. And then I would recommend um, getting an alcohol and drug evaluation. There's a lot of places that offer them, um, even at no cost, um, to get 
more detailed information and find out what the recommendations might be. Um, definitely having open conversations. Sometimes at parents, we get really, we get very worried, we get really concerned, um, and sometimes we get really reactive in that process. Um, and we try to shut it down and have some control over something we don't feel like we can control. And that's true, we can't. So I would encourage not doing those things, not being really reactive and trying to have an open conversation with your child so you can get the help that you need, so they're not pushing back and kind of running away from you. But definitely seeking an alcohol and drug evaluation and then looking at what the options are from there is the best route. And I want to note, we're, um, we're only going to go to about 7.55 with the questions, so I'm not able to read all of them. They are phenomenal questions, thank you, but I'm trying to get to the ones that aren't necessarily duplicative. Are there any long-term emotional symptoms caused by early age marijuana use? Long-term emotional symptoms caused by early, early onset or early use of marijuana. I think we have the doctors. The doctors ready to want to provide the doctor. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, Eric probably speaks the research better. Um, I know that any drug that you use a lot and you're numbing out your emotions and you're you don't learn things. You don't uh, learn how to cope with distress of all kinds, so that can lead to higher levels of anxiety. I think there's some evidence of actually physiologically causing anxiety, a kind of paranoid level of fear even, but definitely anxiety. Even though I've, the kids that I talk to, why do you use that stuff? Well, it helps me be more calm, relaxed, less anxious. It can then paradoxically lead to later increased anxiety. And it's a CNS depressant. It can make you depressed. Um, uh, or it can be a drug that's used to cope with anxiety, depression, particularly social anxiety. So it can mask it or cover it and le keep you uh, from learning other ways to deal with it or getting help for those problems. Eric, do you want to follow up on that? Or? There, there is research uh, looking at the amygdala in the brain and looking at down regulation of receptors in the amygdala of the brain in chronic marijuana users that start at an early age. So again, we're talking about early onset use. We're talking about teens and kids that start using marijuana. Um, they're not exactly sure how that translates, but the amygdala has a lot to do uh, with people's emotional interactions and the, the feelings that people experience. And then, as you discussed, um, there are long-term marijuana users who all of a sudden start to experience acute anxiety when they use marijuana. And sometimes that's when people will quit, when they start having these anxiety symptoms. But we see that working in treatment and behavioral health. We see that, that long-term chronic use of drugs eventually um, can have the opposite effect over time. It's kind of a weird effect, but the body has morphologic changes that it makes in the brain with receptors and neurotransmitters, and it actually becomes worse. So when a person is young, I would say the, the emotional response that, that a person would have if they were, again, a chronic user and they were young, is that they might have anxiety when they don't have marijuana. So I used to have that. So when I was a teenager and whenever I would run out of marijuana, I would get angry and hostile with people to the point that my friends and family would tell me to go smoke weed because I was so anxious, angry, and hostile with people. And that was basically my symptoms of withdrawal. So, um, you know, what I did is I made sure that I never ran out. And my primary method for this is that I would go and get a sack before my current sack ran out. I didn't wait to run out of weed. Whenever my sack would start to get low, that's when I would go get more. People addicted to other drugs do the same thing. Like people addicted to tobacco, people that are addicted to cigarettes, when do they usually go get another pack of cigarettes? When the, before they run out, when they get down to the last two or three. It's like a little alarm bell goes off in your head and says, go get more, go get more. And that was me. So I had that acute anxiety that would happen whenever I abstained from marijuana, whenever I ran out. Next question. Are you aware of the 200 plus children in the state of Oregon using legal medical marijuana to treat conditions such as 
childhood cancer, or epilepsy? If so, what are your thoughts? Anybody on the panel want to address that? Okay, doctor. I actually didn't know that number. Um, I know that there are certainly legitimate medical uses of marijuana. My wife lost two very close friends to cancer uh, sisters, and uh, the younger one uh, a few years ago in San Francisco did use medical marijuana. In that case, she specifically chose a version that had gotten, gave no high. She was appalled by the idea of using marijuana for her pain. She tried everything, and she would you know, blow it out the window so her little one, but it helped somewhat. So there's, there's some very clear uses. So I'm not surprised that there are pediatric cases where uh, medically prescribed marijuana has value. But again, prescribed, carefully used, is different from recreational use. How many people have died from a cannabis overdose? Anyone on the council want to take that? Not very many. Uh, not very many die of the drug overdose. It's not that I know of physiologically dangerous in that way. It's probably more accidents, uh, car accidents, that are causing the fatalities. I would think. And I guess I would have a follow-up on that. Is there a difference from uh, marijuana that you would smoke in terms of its concentration versus hash oil? Uh, that you might take in another form. Yes. Oh, sure. sure. Um, so marijuana that you smoke has, um, I don't know the percentage of the THC. Um, it would depend on what they're smoking. But if you're going to use hash oil, hash oil has anywhere from 70 to 95% THC. So it's way higher than marijuana. So um, a lot of kids, I mean, that's pretty common with our drug court kids is using that because um, the tolerance. So they would smoke marijuana and then that wasn't working anymore. So then they would go on to the hash oil and the dabbing. And I would just say, you know, that's part of the why we're here today is to give you guys this information because it's so very different now than it was when we were growing up, when we were kids, where the THC content was so much lower um, and now it's, you know, like five times higher than it was before. And so that's a, a big concern. Um, I know what marijuana looks like. How do I recognize the other types, oils, candy, et cetera? Um, well, I showed a picture of it. I can, I can pull that up and, and while you continue. Okay. Okay. Well, um, you know, with that, while Eric's going to pull that up and respond to that, I want to please join me in thanking the panel for a fantastic job. Thank you, guys. And the last question I pulled up, and I do want to apologize for not getting to all of them. Uh, you guys had a lot of great questions. Uh, will we have more forms in, our, in, our, in other neighborhoods uh, like this? Well, I know just the person to answer that question. It's Elizabeth Russell. Elizabeth, would you come on up? Uh, what we, oh, here she comes. What we wanted to talk about is what are the next steps? Where else can you go to get more information? And I can't think of someone better to do that than Elizabeth Russell, who is a founder of the Oregon City Together folks. Elizabeth. Thank you. Okay, let me give you this. Thank you so much for, wow, playing the microphone game. Uh, thanks for being here. It's just so wonderful to see so many people caring about their kids and wanting to know more. and you know, being willing to, to learn things that aren't always easy to learn. Um, so yeah, Oregon City Together, we have a new website. So the questions that uh, we didn't get to tonight, we're gonna do our best to answer them. We'll check in with our panel members, we'll check in with our broader coalition members who are also amazing resources in our community, and uh, we'll post as many responses as we can either on our website or on our newsletter. So if you, um, did sign in today, you will be on our list and you can unsubscribe anytime, but we will probably put you on our list and you'll get a newsletter every month or so. And it'll have the information on there. We'll just continue the conversation because there's so much to, to know. Uh, the other thing um, I'm just gonna offer is, we'll start with the green one. The green sheet. Um, so the green sheet is basically an opportunity to participate, to be involved. You can sign up, let us know uh, what is interesting to you, where you're at with things um, related to protecting our youth, um, keeping things um, healthy, 
drug-free in Oregon City. So that's what this green sheet is for. And then the pink sheet is a little eval form. And so we'd love to know your experience of, your, of tonight and how you feel about the time you've taken. And then um, <laughs> more sheets. Um, and then on the back of your program, uh, there's some information here. I'd love to n for you to know that you are invited to, um, we're having an open board meeting and reception uh, in May. And you're certainly welcome to come, meet the board members, learn a little bit more about OC together. It's an amazing group of people, very dedicated, who care about, care about our community. Eric, did you find the... So BHO is, is the resin um, inside marijuana. It's extracted <clears throat> through a variety of techniques. One is, is butane. Um, so it's, it's sort of a sticky resin. It can also be in a more solid type product. And a lot of times uh, people smoke it with a torch. So you might look for a torch or like cans of butane in a kid's room. And it really is dangerous. It really is super dangerous. And I believe you, you might know about this, but um, under ballot measure 91, it's illegal for people to make extracts, right? It, those can only be made by licensed producers. Isn't that correct? Yeah. So, so kids should not be making uh, BHO at home. Um, the Northwest is probably one of the, the most BHO manufacturing unfriendly places in America because of rain and cold. And sometimes people foolishly do this indoors inside their house, and because there are, there are fumes, butane fumes, they become ignited, and we've had a few explosions around Oregon and in Washington where people have been injured um, because we don't have the weather that's uh, sort of friendly for the production of these extracts. So, so it has to be done by licensed extract producers under ballot measure 91, which is actually a really good thing. And, but, you know, you should look for that stuff in your kid's room if you see, you know, cans of butane uh, or torches. This can be achieved with uh, butane uh, and the hash oil. Uh, I would say BHO um, uh, is uh, like uh, we talked about earlier. Um, I've seen ranges anywhere from like 40 to 90%. So I would probably say they probably average somewhere around maybe 70% THC. Great, thank you very much. Well folks, I wanna thank you for coming tonight. Uh, you've been a great audience. I think some of our panelists are gonna be able to stick around just a little bit if you have questions. I know I'll be here. Uh, and so we're welcome, you're welcome to come up and ask us direct questions. Again, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate you coming. <laughs>